gentlemen, from wherever you were joining us uh, and following us this afternoon, welcome to the Geneva Center for Security Policy. All of us here in Geneva are very pleased to have you join us virtually for today's awarding of the 2023 GCSP Prize for Innovation in Human Security and Global Security. I'm GCSP Associate Fellow uh, Dr. Paul Vallée, and it's my pleasure to accompany you uh, for the two and a half hour program uh, this afternoon. Uh, the first part of our interactive webinar uh, will belong to the uh, Geopolitics and Global Futures series, uh, in which uh, Professor Naif Al Rodan and Mr. Gazman Kuskai will discuss the theme of how innovation impacts global security. This will include a, G a q and a in which you are most welcome to ask your questions uh, to our speakers. This afternoon, we're also uh, conducting a prize draw uh, among you participants uh, at which you will be able to win seats for the modules at the Online Geopolitics and Global Futures Symposium of 2024. Uh, after a 15 minute break, we will resume at 1630 Central European time with the announcement of prize draw results and then the award ceremony followed again by an interview and Q&A with this year's top winners. Allow me now to hand you over to our executive director, Ambassador Thomas Graminger, to formally open these proceedings. Well, thank you very much, uh, uh, Paul. Uh, distinguished participants, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to, to extend a warm welcome to each of you on behalf of the Geneva Center for Security Policy as we convene for our annual Innovation Day. This event uh, serves as a platform for promoting innovation and advancing global security. At the outset, uh, uh, my sincere, sincere gratitude goes to uh, Professor Naif Al Rodan, Director of GCSB's Geopolitics and Global Futures Department, and his team for organi or organizing, orchestrating this uh, very significant gathering. Recognizing the pivotal role that innovation plays in our daily lives and its transformative potential on a global scale, particularly in times of rapid change or conflict, is paramount. Cooperation stands as a cornerstone in our uh, collective pursuit of innovation, a shared endeavor that contributes to international peace and security. After all, in a world that is changing so quickly, we need to adapt. And this requires innovation. It is crucial to broaden our understanding of innovation beyond the realms of science and technology. Meaningful dialogue, the exchange of ideas, and meticulous analysis are integral facets of innovation, of the innovation process. As we see it and as we practice it uh, at uh, the GCSB. In an inclusive environment characterized by robust discussions and analysis, we foster collaborative and symbiotic approaches aimed at designing sustainable solutions for a more peaceful future uh, for us all. Today's webinar will start with a presentation by uh, Gazment Huskai. Uh, Gazment is the head of our cybersecurity uh, cluster at uh, the GCSB uh, and an interactive discussion uh, that will be led uh, by Professor Naev Al Rodan on driving cyber resilience uh, toward uh, sustainable global security. The second part uh, of the webinar, as uh, has been uh, alluded to by Paul, will feature the ninth edition of the GCSP Prize for Innovation in Global Security. Since its launch in 2015, this international competition has recognized exceptional projects spanning diverse fields and formats. As we navigate these challenging times, this year's proposal proposals offer uh, indeed hope uh, and creative solutions to address some uh, significant global challenges. 
and I'm uh, delighted to witness such a gathering uh, for the GCSB Innovation Day. I would like to invite you to actively engage in the sharing of ideas and to amplify uh, good practices, thereby contributing collectively to a more prosperous and secure future. Thank you for your attention, and I offer my best wishes for a innovative and fruitful session ahead. Uh, back to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Ambassador Grimminger. I will now invite uh, Professor Naya Falrodan, the Director of the Geopolitics and Global Futures Department and Honorary Fellow, St. Anthony's Oxford, for his own welcome remarks and to introduce today's webinar. Thank you, Paul. Welcome to everyone, uh, to GCSB and to our department's uh, um, Innovation Day and Annual Prize. Uh, we're very thankful to all of you for making the time to join us. Um, uh, let me start by, by uh, mentioning that we are extremely grateful, as always, to our distinguished director, Ambassador Thomas Grimminger, for his tireless leadership and support, not only for traditional uh, peace and security paradigm, but also in innovative ideas in global peace and security. Um, I'm also grateful to our jury, distinguished jury, but I'll come back to that later. Um, our program today, as mentioned uh, um, by Paul and Thomas, is two parts. We will start with a keynote speech uh, in innovation and global security. This year, it will be uh, delivered by our good friend, uh, Gazman Toskai. And the second exciting part, please stay for that, um, is, is the announcement of the top three winners of our 2023 annual uh, International Prize in Innovation in Global Security. Um, but now it's my pleasure um, uh, to, to introduce a, a good friend and a distinguished colleague, um, Gazman Toskai, um, who will talk to us about how innovation impacts global security. Gazman. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I have and thank you very much for the opening ceremony as well, Executive Director. Good afternoon, everyone. And I would like to Thank you again for uh, having me here, as well as the organizers of the GCSPO Innovation Day. So my talk will be about how innovation impacts global security. Before we begin, I believe it is important that all of us have the same understanding of what we mean by innovation. While many definitions exist, I will begin with some basic terms that compose innovation. These terms include invention and creativity. Invention is defined as the creation of something new, such as a new algorithm, program, or software development technique. Creativity is a state of mind which leads to innovative thinking. Therefore, finally, innovation is the creative act and invention carried into wider use, leading to substantial kinds of change. Thus, the successful exploitation of a new idea. As with innovation and its many definitions, so is the case with global security. There are many ways to conceptualize global security, and depending on the level of analysis, the scope of threats, and the actors involved. For the purpose of this presentation, I will use two definitions from reputable sources. The RAND organization, which is a nonprofit research institution that provides policy analysis and solutions on various issues, and the Cambridge Dictionary, a widely used online dictionary. According to the RAND organization, global security includes military and diplomatic measures that nations and international organizations, such as the United Nations and NATO, take to ensure mutual safety and security. The C Cambridge Dictionary, on the other hand, defines global security as the protection of the world against war and other threats. These definitions are not mutually exclusive, but rather complementary, as they highlight different aspects of global security. Therefore, what we mean when we talk about how innovation impacts global security is, in other words, how humankind's creative acts and inventions 
that are carried into wider use lead to a substantial kind of change. Examples include a main battle tank, a combat aircraft, nuclear weapons, space satellites, information and communication technologies, the internet, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. And all of these and how they impact on the measures that organizations are taking to ensure mutual safety and security. Innovations also have implications for global security beyond the military domain. For instance, cybersecurity is a growing concern as more and more activities and services depend on information and communication technology and internetworked information systems. Economic stability is also affected by innovations as they create new opportunities and challenges for trade, development, and competitiveness. Environmental sustainability is another dimension of global security, as innovations can either mitigate or excavate the effects of climate change, pollution, and resource depletion. The evolution and adoption of new technologies and innovation directly influence global security. Some of these innovations have both civilian and military applications, which highlights the dual use nature of innovations. Furthermore, innovations also impact global security in non-military ways, getting back to cybersecurity, economic stability, and environmental sustainability. Now, I will turn the attention to how innovation in information and communication technologies and internetworked information systems may be used for cyber espionage attacks and highlight some of their consequences impacting security. In 2017, a major United Kingdom accounting firm and a British multinational defense company, in collaboration with the National Cybersecurity Agency in the UK, reported a new cyber espionage campaign conducted by a threat actor based in Asia. The report utilizes various analytical methods to attribute the cyber espionage campaign to that particular threat actor. The attackers focused on companies specializing in managing IT and systems for other businesses. These companies have access to their clients' networks, making them very attractive targets. Consequently, these IT management companies are highly sought after targets for cyber espionage. Once the threat actor gains access, it is believed to be relatively easy to exploit this and move potentially onto the networks of thousands of other victims. The cyber operations of this Asian country are linked to its strategic objectives. A cybersecurity firm, which is now part of a larger corporation, released a report in 2013 revealing a multi-year cyber espionage campaign from this country, targeting numerous countries and industries. The report indicates that targeted sectors include information technology, high-tech electronics, financial services, satellite and telecommunications, energy, public administration, scientific research and consulting, chemicals, and aerospace. Evidence connected to this threat, the particular threat actor, to a specific military unit of the country's armed forces. In delving into the domain of global security, it becomes increasingly clear that the interconnectedness of various innovations is not just a feature of technological advancement, but a fundamental aspect that impacts the global security landscape. The cyber espionage tactics that threaten economic stability are inherently linked to advancements in AI and quantum computing, which in turn have profound implications for military strategy and defense capabilities. This complex set, complex set of interdependencies meet the, means that an innovation in one field can have cascading effects across multiple domains. For instance, breakthroughs in artificial intelligence not only enhance the capabilities in cyber defense, but also accelerate developments in autonomous weapon systems, thereby altering geopolitical power dynamics. Similarly, advancements in information and communication technologies have revolutionized how we collect intelligence, 
but they also create vulnerabilities that can be exploited by state and non-state actors alike. For example, an, art an advanced persistent threat actor, which is a highly proficient cyber attack group, has been operating out of Asia. And this group, tracked by a prominent security firm, revealed that it was targeting a lot of global industries with a focus on the, uh, that were using the English as the primary language. Now, in an unusual and significant move for that time, the evidence was compelling enough for a major Western country's Department of Justice to bring charges against individuals from the Asian country. Among the publicly named victims of this advanced persistent threat was a company called Solar World, specializing in solar energy. At the time these attacks were exposed, Solar World was a global leader in solar industry with an annual turnover of 750 million euro. Its competitive edge was in combination of intellectual property and extensive global contracts. However, three years later, Solar World went uh, bankrupt. How does a firm, a market leader in its industry, an owner of cutting edge intellectual property and global contracts, end up insolvent so rapidly? Well, in August 2017, the company declared bankrupt. Market saturation from an Asian country, beginning around the time of the advanced persistent threat attacks in 2012, played a significant role in the company's rapid decline. As stated by this Western country's Department of Justice, and I quote, the perpetrator stole trade secrets that would have been particularly beneficial to companies in the Asian country at the time they were stolen, end quote. The impact on Solar World was significant, as the company's director of strategic affairs was quoted at the time, and I quote, there were thousands of emails exfiltrated, many with sensitive data that would pose to serve all kinds of unfair advantages, end quote. These unfair advantages, again, included intellectual property, sensitive pricing information, and even methods for competitors from the Asian country to bypass Western regulations in dominating the market. In stark contrast, this Asian country has since solidified its position as a leading nation in solar energy, surpassing its 2020 solar targets already in 2017. This was around the same time the country announced the cancellation of numerous coal projects aligning with a, quote, future energy development, end quote goals of its five-year plan, 2016 to 2020. The simultaneous announcement of this country's solar energy achievements and the insolvency of the solar panel company is an interesting twist of fate underscoring their inversely linked fortunes since the advanced persistent threat attack. Looking on a global level, the impact of innovation in security is not confined to any single nation, but ripples across continents shaping international relations in various ways. For instance, the rapid development of artificial intelligence in the US has spurred similar advancements in Asia and Europe, leading to a global race in what could be technological supremacy. This race is not just about technological advancements, but could also be about setting international norms and standards for the use of such technologies. The case of cyber espionage as seen with the solar world incident, is a great reminder of how technological advancements can be leveraged for strategic gains, affecting not only corporate entities, but also national and regional economies and geopolitical balances. In regions like the Middle East and Africa, where technological adoption may vary, innovations in cyber capabilities and unmanned systems by more technologically advanced nations could pose new challenges to regional security dynamics. Similarly, in the Russia-Ukraine war, advancements in information and communications technologies have led to increased use of cyber attacks where the targets are increasingly non-military. Furthermore, the war has acted as a driver of innovation where supporters of Ukraine could conduct cyber attacks 
on Russian targets by simply downloading an app. Unbeknownst to the user, the app was instead collecting all the information on the user's smartphone, likely sending it to an intelligence agency in Russia. On the 13th of December, 2023, a Reuters journalist quoted the president of the European Commission as saying, and I quote, global markets are now flooded with cheaper electric cars and their price is kept artificially low by huge state subsidies. Europe is open to competition, not a race to the bottom, end quote. This, state, this statement highlights the EU's determination to avoid repeating the experience of its solar panel industry, which was decimated by cheaper imports from an Asian country. From an economic intelligence perspective, the solar world case serves as a good example of the impact of cyber espionage on a market capable of wiping out an entire industry. Similarly, the case of electric vehicles demonstrates how innovation bolstered by cyber espionage operations and state support can severely impact the economic security of entities like the European Union. Now, let us turn our attention to another innovation and how it impacts global security, artificial intelligence. According to a report from Stanford, co-authored with some other organizations, until 2012, the growth of AI computational power adhered to Moore's law. The principle observing that computing power roughly doubles every two years. However, after 2012, AI computing underwent a dramatic transformation. The computational power required for AI began doubling at an incredible rate of every 3.2 months, far surpassing the pace predicted by Moore's law. This remarkable acceleration can be attributed to several key factors. Advancements in AI algorithms, increased investment in AI-driven hardware, the exponential growth of data available for AI training, and the rise of deep learning technologies. These developments not only highlight the rapid evolution of AI capabilities, but also underscore the increasing demand for more powerful computing resources to fuel these sophisticated AI systems, marking a new era in the technological revolution. A seminal contribution to this acceleration was the 2017 paper titled Attention is All You Need by researchers from Google Brain and other institutions. This paper introduced the transformer model, a groundbreaking shift in how AI systems process language. By relying entirely on attention mechanisms, the transformer model significantly improved efficiency and effectiveness in handling long-range dependencies in data, setting new benchmarks in natural language processing tasks. This innovation has not only spurred further advancements in AI, leading to more sophisticated models like GPT and BERT, but also has broad implications for AI's role in cyber in global security. In 2016, an artificial intelligence model was developed for combat aircraft. The human pilot, when competing against Alpha, the name of the AI, said, and I quote, I go home feeling washed out. I'm tired, drained, and mentally exhausted. This may be artificial intelligence, but it represents a real challenge, end quote. According to researchers, the Alpha AI designed for combat aircraft Quote, can act on a sensor data to make or change decisions about combat for up to four aircraft in less than a millisecond, moving aircraft to evade missiles and fire weapons while a human pilot essentially manages the overall air battle at a higher level. End quote. In 2020, four years later, an unnamed AI beat a U.S. military fighter pilot in an F-16 dogfight successfully defeating the experienced U.S. fighter pilot in five out of five simulated fights. In February 2023, three years later, 
An unnamed artificial intelligence pilot successfully piloted an F-16 fighter jet for over 17 hours. This is an indicator of a shift from human piloted combat aircraft to so-called uncrewed warfare. The rapid evolution of AI capabilities exemplified by the transformer model and its subsequent developments presents a spectrum of opportunities and challenges in global security. On one hand, these advancements can lead to more efficient data analysis and intelligence collection, thereby enhancing national security. On the other hand, the same technology could be utilized for cyber espionage, autonomous weapons systems, and advanced surveillance, raising ethical and strategic concerns. The dual-use nature of AI technologies means their impact on global security is complex, necessitating careful consideration and international dialogue to harness their benefits while mitigating risks. As AI continues to advance rapidly, integrating it into global security strategies becomes increasingly crucial. Therefore, to answer the answer to how innovation impacts global security is multidimensional. Innovation acts as a double-edged sword. On one hand, it brings out advanced technologies and solutions that, ad- that enhance our defense capabilities, improve intelligence collection, and increase our ability to protect against various threats. On the other hand, the same innovations can be exploited for malicious purposes like cyber espionage, creating new vulnerabilities and challenges in maintaining global stability, safety, and security. This duality necessitates a balanced approach where we embrace and foster technological advancements while being aware of and prepared for their potential implications on global security. With this, I would like to extend my thanks once again to Professor Nayef al and the GCSP uh, organizers and all of you here today for engaging and participating in this crucial dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gasman, for a great talk as always. Um, a little shorter than planned, but that's always a good thing. Uh, um, now we... Um, now the, the floor is open to any questions from, from our distinguished audience. Um, uh, and please enter it into the Q&A function and I'll call on you to ask the question yourself. Uh, or is that not possible? Not possible. So there is um, a question from Slobodan and uh, says, um, maybe you can see it, Gazmat, yourself. Please, is it possible to elaborate a little bit more on innovation on ecological ser- uh, security and environmental sustainability? Thank you very much for the question. So what we're talking about here is the ability to use sensors, distributed s- systems with the help of AI to collect, again, massive amounts of data and with that, use prediction models to see how shifts in uh, ecology, in, in ecology uh, uh, may change and environment may change. With that information at hand, one can use pre-positioning for various reasons, uh, such as both protecting that particular area of, of the environment, but also uh, pre-positioning and putting things in place where in the near future, it would be possible to generate additional um, resources from Earth, for example. I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Gasman. Um, another question from Mr. Kola says, in the context of ongoing global AI, AI race, how do the distinct AI strategies of the US and China reflect their capabilities, intention, and adoption capacities? That's a very good question. So. There is an ongoing global AI race, uh, that's for sure. Uh, Where this may end up, uh, there are different perspectives on that. But when we're talking about, if we're looking into more specific contexts like uh, uh, autonomous weapons systems, there are three countries that are currently leading the race, the US, China, and the Russian Federation. Now, there are different values and discussions on how much decision-making that should be delegated to these uh, autonomous weapons systems. For example, while the United States agrees that certain decision-making needs to be delegated, it is uh, assumed that the Russian Federation is likely to delegate even more. Uh, How much, it's uncertain. 
while in China, their argument is that no, these kind of uh, uh, weapons, autonomous weapon systems, they should not have any form of uh, autonomous decision making, rather it should only be used for research. So that is where we currently stand on those matters. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Gazman. Um, um, another question, which is a classic old question, is uh, how does technology and AI uh, can be useful to counter te and counter terrorism? So, when it comes to terrorism, we need to remember the uh, uh, the roots of it, so to say, in a sense that what are they trying to achieve? Uh, when they when they try to conduct cyber attacks, it's very hard because they do not the effects of terrorist cyber attacks do not have the same uh, uh, implications on the cognitive dimensions as suicide bombers uh, on a market street, for example, uh, because the general idea is that they try to influence. Uh, uh, this, the decision-making processes of a government far away. That, so that we need to understand that as a base. When it comes for terrorist use of uh, uh, the internet, if we look at start there as a next step, we have seen that they have increasingly used it, been using it for for uh, the spread of propaganda and to use it as a recruitment base, but also to generate money. And there is a very good uh, uh, cyber operations titled Operation Glowing Symphony, which details the implications of terrorist activities for the, these kind of media uh, uh, campaigns, recruitment, propaganda, and uh, uh, generation of, uh, of funds. So if we then project this additional into the AI aspect, you can imagine that, for example, uh, without the use of knowledge skills of use of any code, you can generate deep fakes. You can generate uh, artificial voice of people that have never, never said anything. So if we look at the Operation Glowing Symphony, which uh, required a lot of resources to track down the terrorists and, and do something about their activities from a propaganda and recruitment and money financial situation perspective, uh, which was basically in the hands of one or two individuals. Today, anyone can use these tools for the same purposes, which makes it much more challenging for law enforcement agencies to tackle these kind of uh, uh, operations. And that's why it is to a certain extent also uh, uh, in the hands of the companies that are behind these tools that they put in uh, uh, invisible watermarks uh, so they can support law enforcement agencies when deep fakes and other tools uh, are being out, uh, being used for terrorist propaganda, recruitment, and financial purposes. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you, Gasman. Um, question from uh, Claudia Otto. Uh, she asks, what do you think is the best strategy to handle dual-use technologies like AI technologies, i.e. regulatory uh, safety culture, et cetera? So I think that, again, that's also a very good comment in the sense because when we're talking about dual use technologies, we are using one technology that is dual use every day, and that is the internet. On one hand, we're using it to share information, to have a, a gathering like this here on this particular space. And at the same time, it's being used for cyber espionage purposes. It has been declared as a new domain for military operations. So. If we look at that into the AI side of things, of course, we need regulations. We need to regulate to a certain extent the uh, companies that are behind these models. But at the same time, we need a comprehensive approach to tackle this. And there was a huge global meeting in, um, in the UK just a couple of weeks ago where there is an understanding that AI can pose a risk to humanity that everyone agrees on that, but the how to tackle the challenge, that is uh, uh, more challenging because it's very difficult. Regulation, yes, on the one hand, but then also the ability to say what kind of people uh, have access to these tools. 
you need also to have cybersecurity in these on the 29th, I believe it was, of, or 27th of November, the National Security Agency, to, together with the uh, Signals Intelligence Agency of Australia, the National Cyber Security Center in the UK, and a lot of other cybersecurity companies and intelligence agencies came out with guidelines for designing secure AI. So this is a very new challenging field. Uh, uh, we're uh, developing our understanding as we go. And uh, one part is regulation, but it's not the silver bullet to everything. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Gasmund. Uh, our own Paul Ballet asks, uh, um, who is in the lead of the development of this technology? Is it the private sector or the public? Are these cases, are there cases where they cooperate rather than compete? So when it comes to technologies like these, it's always the private sector in most of the cases that, that lead this uh, uh, development. And why is that? Well, because in general, these uh, organizations tend to be smaller. Uh, they are at the forefront uh, developing and working with these tools. So they just want to make it work. And if you look at historically, in general, when it comes to information communication technologies, the idea is that there is a problem and the solution to that problem is likely technology, which means we need to do something and develop a solution to that problem as soon as possible. And there's a lot of work being pushed and a lot of resources behind that work. And then it hits the market. Uh, and what, once it hits the market and people start to understand and, and play around with it, then they realize, oh, maybe there are vulnerabilities in it. Maybe we should do something about it. Now, the, and, and this is unfortunately the case that the cycle is. There's a problem. Technology is the solution. People work hard. They pro produce a, a, a solution, which usually is full of holes, vulnerabilities and flaws, unintended, of course. Um, and then you need to do something about it. So, for example, just uh, a couple of days ago, there was a research article that came out where researchers from a broad number of universities have been able to reveal some of the training data that has been used on a popular uh, GPT model or large language model. So, to get to sum up, it's the private sector that is leading, and we're not seeing that only in AI. We're also seeing it in a lot of other fields. Uh, there is, for example, a lot of information out there where intelligence agencies, uh, so certain intelligence agencies, have actually come to the conclusion that it's better for them to move their data to the cloud than to try to create their own very secure systems because they can't uh, cope anymore with a fast and rapid technological evolution. Thank you. Thank you, Gasmund. Uh, while waiting for more questions on the on the function, maybe I can ask you something. Given the um, please um, the the potential or the, uh, not necessarily eminent of AGI and artificial general intelligence and maybe sentient uh, AI, um, how and who uh, can keep uh, cutting edge uh, c private companies um, on the right track as they balance safety? versus profitability and first to market? That's a very good question. And I think we saw some of those, uh, the, the um, effects of that, those two forces uh, a couple of weeks ago when the CEO of OpenAI, Sam Altman, was fired from the company. And one minute later, Microsoft, who's put a lot of resources in backing the company, was notified. And allegedly, I'm saying allegedly because it's based on open sources, the sheer structure of that company, OpenAI, which is not the private company per se that is working for profit, but more of a foundation kind of sort. I'm uncertain the exact legal term of it. Part of the company was working to work for safe and secure AI for mankind. However, as the other part of the company realized what they were able to do, and it actually started to work to a certain extent, and they realized they can make a profit out of it, these two forces started to compete with each other, which then led to the outing, uh, uh, firing of, of the previous CEO, and then the reinstating of him. So 
the intent was at the start, but uh, when it comes to a higher general level, if you wish, again, it's only through regulation, but it's a very, very tough balance because regulation is really not a precise surgical tool. It's quite uh, broad, it's blunt, and it's developed and designed by such a way that it leaves room for interpretation. I'm not a lawyer myself, but this is what I've learned speaking to a lot of lawyers on in the, on the defense side of things. Um, so that's where we are. And I think uh, when it comes to AGI, we're, things are going much more faster than, than we believe. And I we can see various indicators, such as the 30th of November last year, OpenAI re, uh, released ChatGPT to the world. On the 6th of November this year, which means less than a year, they announced a new model with new capabilities. The previous model, 3.5 and then 4.0 that came out in, in March, the one that came out in March was capable of keeping in mind information up to three pages. The model that came out and was announced on, on the uh, 6th of November uh, can keep in mind information uh, of more than 300 pages. So that is a significant uh, exponential growth, if you wish. And if you do a bit of a very simple math and you, you have take a lot of assumptions uh, and made make a measurement in, in tokens, and if we assume that the human mind has 1 billion tokens in the continued pace that we have right now with only two data points, it's very likely that we may see a model with 100 billion tokens in less than five years. And that's going to be very interesting. Yes, I, mean, I actually read something uh, two days ago that uh, by 2028 uh, is a serious prediction, um, which is five years, just as you said, um, that AGI is extremely likely to be upon us. Um, Absolutely, because the thing is, in 2017, there was a, an experiment done by Facebook where they took two of their chatbots and presented them with a problem. The problem was a bartering problem. One of the chatbots was going to try to sell it as expensive as possible. And the other one was going to buy it as cheap as possible. During the dialogue between those two in the bartering uh, negotiation position, uh, they suddenly started to stop speaking English in English and deteriorated into a language that the uh, researchers could not understand. It, it's quite funny. It's online there. And what happened was because the researchers had not put a specific requirement enforcing the models to use English as a bartering language, they did something that's called emergent behavior in AI agents. So they, during this repetitive process, they develop something of their own. And this is what is interesting because these models are so big, trained on vast amounts of data, very complex, that researchers don't know what's happening in them. And during, if I recall, if I may recall this, uh, the firing of the CEO, Sam Altman, there was one piece of information that came out of the, all of this that was really interesting, at least from my perspective. And that was that they have internally a, a research project called QSTAR. And that QSTAR project is the synthesis of creating an AI science team with multiple models. And then the question that arises is, what kind of emergent AI behavior has occurred when you're synthesizing or bridging these kind of models together. That's very interesting, Gazman. And then the question of regulatory oversight, which you mentioned, I mean, uh, do, uh, I, I like you, uh, I don't know how corporate entities work, but how, how do regulatory um, structures know uh, about what is, what is happening within companies? Um, or is it uh, sort of, um, sort of uh, an innovative, um, um, responsible act on the part of some of the senior researchers? How does it work typically? So typically in a corporation is there are laws and regulations in place. And 
companies need to comply. So a company tends to have a data protection officer. They can have a chief information security officer. They have some IT people. They have a legal entity and or compliance, which means this audit function and the compliance function and the legal department, they constantly must make sure that they comply to current laws and regulations. Because if they do not do that and a breach occurs, for example, and, and they leak a lot of personal data, if we look in the particular cybersecurity domain where the general data protection regulation, which is EU law, companies can be uh, uh, penalized with a lot of uh, high hefty sums of money. So that means to comply and to be allowed to operate as an organization, as a private entity, you need to comply to uh, uh, current laws and regulation. Which then comes to the other side of the field. What happens when you don't have laws and regulations on certain research-based activities, such as open AI, which the idea has been to create AI for humanity and, and, and make a, a more a better world, if you wish. Uh, then, of course, again, Law is very slow. So once humans and policymakers and lawmakers start to understand what these things can, uh, the implications of these things, then they wake up and then they need to put things in place. So law is always uh, uh, lagging behind. But I mean, that's in theory, but in practical terms, given the, the high uh, consequence of a, a very pioneering intellectual property innovation within a particular company. Um, uh, what I was trying to get to is how does a regulatory framework get to that? Um, because I suspect there's all kinds of layers on top of that to protect it, uh, even within the company, probably. Is there a mechanism, uh, maybe you, none of us know that, but is there a mechanism where um, uh, the, the ultra secrecy of cutting edge intellectual property innovation does not apply to regulatory uh, structures, oh, or does it? Well, uh, again, uh, companies have uh, um, a lot of freedom of movement in what they can do. And when you are in a cutting edge situation, like, for example, OpenAI or other companies, there is no legal space there. To, uh, un unless, of course, they break some of the current legal uh, uh, frameworks. But in relation to keep maintaining intellectual property, which this that falls under that umbrella, then, of course, they are protected by current laws that ensure that that property is their own. But the implications of releasing AI to the world, there's, until now, uh, and until the meeting just a couple of weeks ago, there is nothing. By the way, just parenthetically for the audience, when we talk about AGI, what we mean is artificial general intelligence, which means, just nomenclature wise, is when there's an AI system that equates or supersedes human capacity. Just, I thought I'll just throw that in there. Um, That's a good point. question from uh, uh, Zal, um, uh, um, who says, who in your opinion is the winner in the cyber espionage uh, uh, space actually currently? Hard so that that's very that's a very uh, good question, but a tough question to answer. So regardless of how I answer it, it's never going to be hundred uh, percent. First, there are there's a, a database out there that you can uh, use your favorite search engine to look for. It's called the Cyber Operations Tracker. So if you go into that one, it's been collecting a lot of cyber operations since two thousand five, and you can filter it, and then you'll see which of the countries are on top, but they are on top because they have become known. These countries' cyber operations have become known, and that's why they have been put in that database, which means that successful cyber operations, espionage operations, which are never, which never see the, the, the daylight of media reporting, are not part of that. So we can, of course, make very good assessments on which countries are on which level, but uh, that would be a different uh, um, an, a different exercise. So I hope that partially answers your question. 
Thank you, Gasmund. A um, question from Enis. Uh, she asks, how could advancements in quantum computing affect cybersecurity in the coming years? So if right now there are quantum proof encryptions that are uh, encryption algorithms that are being presented, um, because if, say, that we have a full-function quantum system coming up tomorrow or in the coming years, then uh, they can break everything, all encryption, within minutes. And that means that all an encryption is needed not only for privacy, but also to ensure trust in the information that uh, uh, these information systems are managing for us. So, for example... I'm speaking here right now in front of this camera, but through a very good successful man in the middle attack, if they would have a quantum computer breaking the encryption of our connection, I mean, I'm sitting here talking what I'm saying, and they may inject something totally different, and you may see something totally different. You may hear, you may see me, but you may hear something different, or you may see someone else. And that, in turn, leads to distrust. And once you start to have to not have trust in these systems, uh, it's going to be very challenging for humans to cooperate, to do business online. So it's, it won't have just impact on economic security, but also on national, regional and international security. So that would be a game changer. And just to thank you, Gazma, to follow up on the quantum thing, there was a, maybe a, our audience saw that a, a CBS um, CBS uh, uh, news station in the US uh, 60 Minutes program had on quantum computing this week um, and um, they were looking at IBM, Google and Honeywell uh, or the, uh, as well as China of course uh, as the big leaders in this space and um, what I hadn't realized actually uh, as I saw that is that a quantum computer which of course is, works with qubits rather than zero one uh, issues is that it um, uh, and they estimate by the end of this decade, by 2030, that they will have a functioning quantum computer um, and that it will be as as capable as a million super existing supercomputers. I mean, those those I mean, that kind of language is mind boggling to me. Is that is that I'm, I'm, I assume it's feasible. Otherwise, they wouldn't put it on. No. Absolutely. I mean, the thing with uh, technological development is. Uh, you, you take, you do your work by trial and error. So you get it to work a bit and then it works for a millisecond, nanosecond, and then it breaks. And then, okay, you got that piece working, but the rest isn't working. And then you continue this iterative, iterative process until you get it working. And then once you get it a good enough solution, then you release it to the market. So, I mean, and, and the, the, the uh, development of these systems is actually going fairly well. And uh, to my surprise, uh, it's been going overly well than anticipated a couple of years ago where uh, uh, people were believing that it's going to take 50 years or, or more to get them functioning. But it's going overly well, uh, actually. And it may be very possible that we may see them by uh, uh, 2030, as you said. And then take that and combine it with AI, hardware and software. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's very, very scary stuff. And actually, the, the lead uh, researcher in IBM who, was, who appeared in the program said he and his fellow uh, researchers see absolutely no obstacles in getting there. Now, it's a question of really refining things and what they call coherence. Uh, yeah. you, you're, the, you're the expert in that. That was the only thing they need to refine. Um, but otherwise, there is really no, there's nothing intellectual or technological um, that's stopping them from getting there. They're, they're certain they're, they're going to get there. Um, and of course, if, if that happens, um, quantum supremacy will occur and, and that will have huge consequences for for hegemony and dominance, whoever gets there first, I suspect. And, and I fully agree, and you're absolutely right. Whoever gets there first, the combination of quantum with AI, I mean, that's it, it's the, they are in a position to dominate everything. Mm -hmm. And then the question comes, if you have those capabilities at hand, what is the role of the United Nations? Do we care about it? If being in a 
hypothetical scenario where a nation would hold all of those capabilities, when you could do mass influencing online, because these tools, AI, the more complex and powerful they get, what they can do is, hypothetically speaking, they can create behavioral patterns and create so-called patterns of lives of every one of us right now in this space in real time and learn as they go. So if you look at, for example, the alleged uh, uh, Russian meddling in the US elections in 2016 and compare it to such a futuristic scenario where it can an AI can go down to the individual level and in real time adapt, those are like blunt tools from the Stone Age, the Russian in, uh, alleged Russian influence operations, because these uh, 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 AI models would then not only be able to do that, if it would be felt that it is threatened, again, alleged hy hypothetical scenario, they could, for example, be able to create uh, counterintelligence networks to create these patterns of lives of individuals and preempt preemptively neutralize them so the AI doesn't get hurt. That's well, quite scary. I, I think it is super scary um, uh, because I think the likelihood of that happening is, is extremely high. And uh, you may say, well, the UN or anybody, will, a lot of people will care, but there's not a whole lot they can do about it. Uh, I, I think that, that um, uh, we'll try and remain a little optimistic here. So uh, a question from uh, Claudia um, says, laws are in general uh, technologically neutral. Uh, so there are always laws that apply. Only loopholes have to be identified to be closed. Um, is that relevant to these cutting edge corporate entities, you think? Well, I mean, that's so again, it's uh, there are laws in place that that like um, guide the uh, movement of a company, if you wish. And of course, there are loopholes. And uh, this is what threat actors uh, do. They try to find these loopholes because, again, laws, uh, I'm not a legal expert, but I know that they are devised to give room for interpretation. So the idea of searching for holes in law is a term called lawfare. And there are countries who actually engage in this where they find these loopholes and then they exploit them to advance their own strategic objectives. So hence my previous uh, um, comment that laws are in place, they're good, but they're very blunt. Thank you, Gasman. A question from Lisa. She says, can you elaborate a bit on the relevance of cybersecurity in the context of our increasing reliance on space assets, i.e. satellites? What are the potential threats that we are facing? So we, as humans, here on Earth, we rely a lot on, on the satellite systems. Uh, a lot of things that we're doing uh, today would not be feasible uh, without their existence. And just a couple of weeks ago, um, there was this, uh, uh, I think in October even, there was this DEF CON uh, conference in the US and they put up a satellite up there for hacking. And obviously they hacked it quite easily because satellites uh, don't have that good cybersecurity, which is a bit unfortunate. But again, if we, start, if we look at the timelines, we had satellites in space much earlier in time then we had the uh, internet being released to the public. So thinking that someone would start to attack these systems from ground using computers, which everyone has access to, at that time, I don't think a lot of people thought about it. There are even quotes that are saying, I, uh, from some popular CEOs during the 70s, I would think, uh, the world will likely need at the most three computers or something like that. Again, which gives you the idea that they didn't think that these things would that take like took stories of of, uh, of buildings would end up being more powerful than NASA had when they sent up the first Apollo mission in our, our pockets. Um, so, if satellites start to fall down, uh, we will have difficulties of tracking time. Time is really important for all of the systems from the. The, the, the booking that you do for travel, 
to going to the shop, buying your food, uh, to everything. If you can manipulate time, then all these systems will have huge challenges to process uh, the information and money flows will be inhibited. So just talking about that, uh, and I'm leaving out the military and other domains there. Yeah, thank you, guys. Exactly, and and of course the cyber, the, the the space domain being a distant domain, all our connectivity with it is, is through cyber. So its vulnerability is, is absolutely real, um, mm -hmm. and especially in the absence of regulatory frameworks, uh, which uh, which are very very thin, um, uh, and a lot of uh, uh, space treaties need to be updated. But there's very little appetite uh, to actually yeah. to do them, given the asymmetry. Of, of capacity of leading states, uh, US, China, Russia, and the rest of humanity. But the US is on top of all of the above in any way. Um, 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 I don't see any more questions. Um, I think there um, was a question for you a bit earlier, uh, Professor. So if I may read it, question to Professor Alredan. To what extent does the context of the global AI race consider and address potential biases inherent in AI technologies, and how might these biases impact the evaluation of the capabilities and intentions of different countries in the international system? I mean, my, my general answer to that is um, our global system is what we call a self-help system uh, with no overarching authority. So it's, uh, and, and the idea of, of fair play or justice or accountability is not part of the lexicon of, of the global system, unfortunately. So it's, um, and what governs state behavior uh, for the most part is very narrow geopolitical goals that serve the national interest. Um, responsible states often do it so using AI or other um, modalities uh, in symbiotic um, um, ways with other entities. Others, it's a zero sum paradigm. Um, but the global system is a zero sum paradigm and biases and everything else that goes with it are part of the game. Now, whatever gives someone an edge, um, that entity will do it, that government or corporate entity. Um, that's why in my various um, work, uh, you know, I was calling for what I call multi-sum security because I, what I was thinking that in this in instantly connected and deeply interdependent world, Zero sum paradigms don't work in the short term. They may work in the short term, but they're counterproductive. Um, and given the interdependence nature of corporate entities, but that of course doesn't apply to cutting edge AI or quantum computing, which is highly is likely to be highly exclusive. In uh, follow up, and we'll end with this because I think we're running out of time. Follow up to the um, cyber uh, space after space issue is the uh, the cyber nuclear uh, nexus. Uh, uh, that is becoming a serious issue because a lot of nuclear um, um, uh, devices and, and nuclear um, structures have a lot of cyber uh, um, to, to run them, to control them. Um, and there's a lot of concern within the geopolitical community that, that this is a huge vulnerability, just like the outer space. A any comment on that? What, what do you know about that? You're absolutely right. Uh, just yesterday, there was uh, news uh, coming out of the uh, British new uh, newspaper, The Guardian, where uh, one of the uh, nuclear power plants uh, has been breached and allegedly the first indicator of compromise was already in 2015. And which means just what you said. A lot of these technologies are inherently being more connected, interconnected. So you have nuclear nuclear power plants, you have power substations, which rely on industrial control systems. And these industrial control systems, they are designed with a whole different purpose, either to save human lives or ensuring some piece of equipment doesn't break. Uh, and with that said, it means also that they are require a high uh, uh, level of av availability, constantly connected, constantly ensuring that information flows go uh, as fast as possible. So, and then you take these systems that don't, are not designed with cybersecurity in mind and connect them with managed information systems 
the PCs and whatnot we have, we combine these two because we want to ensure the smooth operation. We want to ensure that there are no cascading effects, et cetera, et cetera. But then these systems in turn are connected to the internet. And that's the way in threat actors can, can get. And the cybersecurity components of these industrial control systems is, for example, a white paper, if you look at that, it can say, turn off the firewall of the antivirus, which is totally the opposite of what we're saying in cybersecurity. Turn on your firewall and turn on your fi- ant- uh, antivirus. Because as soon as data packets, information flows st- are being stopped and controlled for malicious content, the impact on the power substation or on the nuclear power plant could be cascading effects and, and fail, fails on those systems. Therefore, uh, threat actors, they have time on their side. A lot of them, they can do these kind of, you can provide them with a problem. And there is, uh, uh, again, The Guardian, Der Spiegel, and some other newspapers in March this year, they came out with a series where a cybersecurity company had posed a problem to some of its staff, try to breach into the Mühleberg nuclear power plant outside of Bern. And that gives them something to do. It's an intellectual challenge. And what do these people do? Of course, they will sit down day in and day out over a long period of time until they get access. And that's a bit frightening too. So then the question comes, once they have access, do they have the orders to stop there? Good, you've generated it. Or because a part of the problem, again, a human issue here, is that some of these people, they may have some neuro uh, uh, psychological issues where they break things, they're very good at breaking things, and once they're in there, there's really nothing stopping them from pressing the button. And that's very, very wor- worrisome. Um, I'm sorry to our audiences for being so uh, Debbie Downers and pessimistic, but uh, it, it is what it is. Um, so grateful to you, Gasmund, for your uh, genius and, and insightful commentary. Um, and so please join me in, in thanking Gasmund for his outstanding talk and, and discussion. Thank you, Gasmund. Um, Thank you very much for the invitation. So and and back, back to you, Paul. Uh, well, uh, thank you to our speakers, uh, both uh, indeed uh, to uh, Gasmund uh, and to uh, Professor Al Rodan for this, uh, uh, of course, very uh, stimulating uh, discussion on on so many issues uh, as well. Uh, I'm sure we um, will continue to have questions on these uh, matters. Uh, so I think the time has now come for us to uh, take a uh, break. Uh, we're slightly ahead of schedule, but uh, um, uh, it's my belief that uh, we've also uh, completed the prize draw. Uh, so we'll be able to uh, resume at uh, 1630 as planned, uh, and we will announce uh, all of this uh, as well. So uh, wish you a good break and see you very soon. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Geneva Center for Security Policy for the award of the 2023 GCSP Prize for Innovation in Global Security. I'm handing you over to Professor Nayef Al-Rodan, who will introduce the members of the jury. Thank you, Paul. Welcome back from the break. Um, This is the second and exciting section of uh, our afternoon. Um, and it is our annual um, uh, Innovation Prize in Global Security. Um, uh, before I, I mention the jury, the distinguished jury members, let me just uh, explain to our audience um, how many people applied and from where, um, which is, uh, and it's, we typically get about 150 applicants from all over the place. And this year we had 153 applicants from six continents. Um, led by Africa with 91 applications, Um, Asia 36, Europe 15, um, Central and South America 3, North America 6, and Oceania 2. And the topics uh, ranged um, widely from climate change to cyber to space and to theory building. 
Um, back to the jury, we're extremely grateful for our distinguished jury members um, um, who, who work so, so hard to dissect uh, um, uh, those uh, applicants to the top three. It's extremely hard work and they're very busy and distinguished people and we're forever grateful um, for their um, help and, and, and knowledge and distinction that they bring to the table. The panel of our judges this year is Ambassador Gabriel Luchinger, who's the head of international security at the FDFA State Secretariat in Bern. Uh, Lieutenant General retired Andre Blattman, who's the former chief of the Swiss Armed Forces. Uh, Ms. Angela Kane, senior fellow at the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. Professor Jane Royston, entrepreneur and member of the Swiss Science Council. Uh, Ms. Uh, Lauren Anderson, founder and CEO of LC Anderson International Consulting and a former FBI executive. Ambassador Thomas Griminger, our illustrious and distinguished leader, and myself. Uh, back to you, Paul. Um, unmute, please. We, we can't hear you, Paul. My apologies. Thank you, Nayef. Um, I'll uh, now uh, take the opportunity to announce the uh, winners of the prize draw uh, for the uh, 2024 Geopolitics and Global Futures uh, Symposium. Uh, well, as you can see, uh, you have uh, several dates uh, that are appearing on the screen. And for those of you, of course, who are uh, interested in, in details of the themes, of the uh, symposium that is going to be spread uh, out at uh, these uh, different dates. I'll call your attention to your uh, chat box in which the, the colleagues uh, gave the link uh, with where you could get details of the dates and the themes uh, of the uh, symposium. Uh, so we have, of course, three place uh, winners. Um, and we'll start with third prize. So that is one free seat to one module. Um, of the uh, symposium and it has a value of 500 Swiss francs. The winner is Mr. Peter Crow. Congratulations. Uh, second prize uh, is two seats uh, to, or so free seats to two modules uh, of the uh, symposium that has a value of 800 Swiss francs. The winner is Captain Helder Jesus, congratulations. And finally, the first prize is uh, three seats to three modules of the symposium and that has a value of 1,200 uh, Swiss francs. The winner is Miss Manon Blancafort, congratulations to you. And I think that leads us now, uh, of course, to the announcement uh, for the 2023 Prize for Innovation in Global Security. Uh, it will be my honor to announce uh, the team and project who have won third place and a GCSP uh, Certificate of uh, Recognition. The winner is Environment of Peace Initiative, submitted by the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute, CIPRI, in Sweden. Uh, they will be represented uh, today uh, by uh, Ms. Claire McAllister, who's going to speak on behalf of a very wide team of 65 members uh, who, uh, and you can see their names here, uh, who uh, were associated uh, with this, uh, this initiative. So really congratulations to all of you for uh, earning this uh, GCSP Certificate of uh, Recognition. And uh, we should now hear from uh, Ms. Claire McAllister on their behalf. Yes, thank you so much um, uh, to you and to all the members of the jury and to everybody at GCSP who's involved in this prize. Um, we are absolutely delighted to receive this award. And as you say, I kind of accept it on behalf of a huge team of people. Um, it was really a team effort, um, over 30 researchers undertaking the research um, that went into 
to both the policy report and our research report, which were both published last year. Um, and alongside them, we were kind of led and steered by both an international panel of experts and a youth panel, um, and then supported by our wonderful operations and communications team here at CIPRI. Um, and we did this uh, whole project almost entirely via Zoom. We had panelists ranging from kind of uh, Mexico through to New Zealand, and we had researchers going from the west coast west coast of the US uh, over to Australia. So it was a fantastic um, uh, project, which uh, enabled through a pandemic from through the through the magic of technology. Um, the initiative really was aiming to build awareness and strengthen understanding of the interconnections between climate change and environmental degradation and peace and security, and to present some very clear and practical recommendations for decision makers. And I think over the course of the three and a half years of the project, we have seen even more acutely how these environmental crises are affecting daily lives and our peace and security around them. So we really hope through the publication of the report, but also through through the process of building the report and through all the outreach and dissemination we've done afterwards, we've tried to help make some very practical recommendations about how we can think much more holistically about environmental challenges and about peace and security challenges and how we can use climate action in particular as a way to kind of support and build a, a more just and peaceful future. Um, so I will leave it there, um, but thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Claire. Uh, and uh, of course, we'll have a chance to uh, talk a little bit more in detail later on during the, the Q&A uh, with you and uh, the other winners. I'm going to turn over now to uh, Professor Al Rodan to announce uh, second place. Thank you, Paul. Um, the uh, second winner uh, is on the project of global security and justice um, by Chexal. Um, uh, on accurate and portable water testing kits for disease prevention of waterborne pathogens. And it was submitted by Dr. Praveen Kumar Kavieri, uh, Mr. Matteo Chesi, uh, Mr. Kush uh, Rostagi, uh, Mr. Martin Anker, and Mr. William McKenney. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. So I'm glad to be here to receive the, this award. This is very meaningful for us as we are a team of scientists that is trying to make uh, products that have a real impact within uh, society, especially low-income countries, uh, through our effort, through our science. So we are really happy to, to be here, receive this award, and we are more than happy to discuss it further throughout the Q&A. So thank you so much for this recognition. Well, congratulations, uh, Matteo Cese, and to the uh, Chexal team. Uh, I'll now hand you over to our executive director, uh, Ambassador Thomas Gorminger, who is going to announce the first place winner. Thank you, Paul. So, uh, the winner is uh, measuring norms in outer space, the ITU Compliance Assessment Monitor. The project uh, was submitted by Thomas Gonzalez uh, Roberts uh, of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Center for Strategic and International uh, Studies. Um, and you um, win a certificate of excellence, a prize trophy, as well as uh, 10,000 uh, Swiss francs. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador, for the kind introduction. And um, please allow me to uh, begin by thanking the GCSP, GS, uh, GCSP, uh, both his research and administrative staff, as well as the prize selection committee for honoring me today with this generous recognition. I've made pursuing peace and security in outer space my life's work, but don't get me wrong, I know that I bit off more than I could chew there, as it's inherently an international domain and addressing security challenges in outer space requires a unique breed of collaboration, one that transcends traditional communities of research and practice in international relations, sustainability studies, but also physics and engineering. 
And as an astrodynamicist at MIT and an international affairs specialist at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, I apply space mission analysis tools to answer critical questions pressing decision makers in the space domain. And the portion of my work honored with today's prize is a good example of this approach in which I compare orbital data describing satellite trajectories all around the Earth with rules for international coordination developed and administered by the International Telecommunication Union, a specialized agency of the United Nations. And my work, which I understand I'll be able to talk about more in a moment, answers important questions like who's following the rules in outer space? And are there any patterns with which space operate, operators are, are violating the rules that we do have? And how can a better understanding of these practices inform the creation of new agreements in multinational fora? And before my time runs out, I'm looking at the clock, I'd like to take a moment to thank the collaborators who enabled the success of this project, including my colleagues at MIT, most especially my doctoral committee, Richard Linares, Oli Devec, Moriba Ja, and Brian Whedon, but also my friends and colleagues at the MIT Astrodynamics, Space Robotics, and Controls Laboratory. I want to thank my partners at the EPFL Space Center in Lausanne, who hosted me during my field research in Switzerland. Uh, the generous engineers and career staff at the ITU Space Services Department, the reason why I went to Switzerland to get guidance and, and um, get some advice during the development of my compliance assessment algorithm. And of course, my, my family and loved ones who I understand are watching from different corners of the world. Uh, this morning here on the East Coast, I'm calling from Cambridge, Massachusetts, but also in other places that mean a lot to me. So thank you again to the GCSP. Uh, GCSP, and most especially its distinguished geopolitics and global futures program under the leadership of, of you, Professor Nayef al -Rodan. It really is an honor. So thank you. And I will, I believe now, well, thank you uh, and congratulations, uh, Thomas. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, your project shortly uh, in the uh, the Q and A, uh, but uh, I believe uh, Professor uh, Al Rodan is now going to invite uh, uh, some of the members of our jury who've had, uh, of course, some uh, interesting comments and feedback uh, to uh, give about uh, the uh, prize. Thank you, Paul. Um, good to see you, Thomas, and many congrats. Uh, uh, you're a distinguished friend of the program. You've always uh, um, provide outstanding input, and we're very happy that you uh, made it. Uh, it makes us all feel good. Um, now, if I could uh, ask our distinguished jury members, those of us, though, those of them who are here, if they want to make any commentary on um, the three prizes conceptually, I'm, I'm not interested in specifics. Um, um, I know some of them are not uh, here for uh, for good reasons, um, but whoever the Lauren I saw you earlier, um, um, do you wanna or whoever else um, wants to jump in first? Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nayef. Uh, as always, it's an absolute delight to be a part of this. Um, for those who don't know, this is my fifth year serving as a member of the jury, and it started after spending three months at the GCSP as an executive in residence. So in general, I have loved and looked forward to being a part of evaluating these um, applicants every single year. And I want to go back to one of the comments Ambassador Greminger made, and that is hope. You know, as I sit here, as we all sit here in a very challenged world, these projects and coming from all around the world and people from all kinds of demographics, all kinds of backgrounds, they give me hope. They fill me with hope that there are so many people concerned with trying to address some of our biggest challenges. And in the past years, we've seen much more in the way of um, applicants coming, looking at space, which is a, a special um, a special area for you and IF, I know, uh, and an area that really needs a lot more attention. You know, the vast majority of the world in the corporate sector, better in the government, they're not paying attention to the fact that space is a real challenge for us in a lot of ways. And similarly, the environment. And it's great to see so many projects looking at the interconnectivity of security with all of these aspects. And I will close my comments with just, I would like to highlight one thing. I like to go back 
and follow up on some of the applicants that we've had over the years and see how they're doing. So I've actually kind of made this an informal thing that I do periodically during the year. And one of our applicants from last year who did not make the top three, um, but I would just like to mention, because I think it's an example of the quality that we get, is um, an organization called Common Mission Project. They submitted under Hacking for Defense. And they have expanded globally. And what they've done that's so unique and so wonderful and well outside the United States, although it's, the original is based here, is they've harnessed the power of academic institutions, in particular students, largely undergraduate students, sometimes graduate students, along with government and industry. And they work together to try and address some of the most vexing challenges that governments have. And out of this has spun an enormous number of entrepreneurial enterprises around the globe. And I think that's just one example of the quality of the applicants that we get each year. And it is very tough to come down and pick those top three. So it's it's an honor to continue to be a part of this. And uh, I thank you all. Thank you, especially Nayef and to GCSP for continuing to include me. Thank you, Lauren. The, the pleasure is all ours. We're, we're really honored to have you uh, and your commitment and, and great effort is enormously appreciated. And uh, we hope to uh, get the benefit of your wisdom for the long future. Thank you so much, Lauren. Um, any any other members of distinguished, uh, I don't have the panel in front of you, of the distinguished jury who wants to jump in? Maybe not, Lauren. You spoke on behalf of everyone. Everyone, I'm grateful to you. Um, thank you very, very much. Uh, back to you, Paul. Uh, thank you, and 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 of course, uh, well, thanks, Lauren, uh, and other uh, all of your uh, uh, jury uh, colleagues. I think you, you indeed, you know, emphasized uh, the fact that you uh, look very carefully at these uh, very numerous projects, uh, uh, as we said, you know, with their. Uh, subject and geographical range, uh, which is uh, ever more impressive uh, over the years uh, and so on. But we're now going to honor, of course, uh, uh, our 2023 uh, winners, and we'll give them a, a little chance to elaborate uh, for uh, those of you following us this afternoon uh, about uh, their innovation and their contribution and uh, uh, what they uh, hope uh, the uh, their uh, recognition uh, in this GCSP prize uh, will help them. So we'll, we'll start um, with Thomas Roberts. Uh, so for the first place uh, winners. Um, so of course, good to see you again, Thomas. Um, you've already of course alluded to uh, uh, what uh, the uh, ITU uh, CAM uh, is uh, all about, but perhaps you can uh, uh, tell us, you know, uh, of course, uh, beyond the fact that it's your life, life's work, uh, what are the kind of needs that inspired you to develop this tool and, and how is it intended to be used? Thank you, uh, Dr. Vallee. I think that this, there's a pressing moment happening right now, which is that the growth of satellites entering the near Earth space environment has approached an exponential model. This is an explosion of the number of objects orbiting the Earth, both functional and non-functional, posing a threat of collision. But even in just the functional ones, we're talking about the order of thousands and tens of thousands of new satellites. And there's only about 4,000 to 5,000 operational satellites in orbit right now. And what does that, what does that really mean? It means we have to get a lot smarter on our tools for international coordination to make sure that those satellites that are providing critical services for people on the ground, most interestingly perhaps is worldwide low latency broadband internet. We wanna make sure that they, they're operating in corners of their radio frequency spectrum that don't conflict with one another. They're not issuing harmful interference to one another and preventing their services from reaching the ground or worse yet colliding with one another and creating more debris in the space environment. To do that, we lean on multinational bodies 
like the International Telecommunications Union, to administer special rules and processes to make sure that different actors can share with the world the kinds of corners of the space environment that they'd really like to be operating in, what plans they have for the future and, and, and what steps they're taking to really get there and to make sure that they're doing it in such a way such that if they do achieve success, they can operate freely in that environment, free from the threat of harmful interference or collision. And that's a pressing need we have right now in the lowest reaches of the near Earth space environment, what's called low Earth orbit. But that problem has been addressed in a different corner of the near Earth space environment, the geostationary belt, 36,000 kilometers above the equator, where I specialize in my technical field of astrodynamics. There's been a, a system of coordination in place there for over 40 years. And never has there been a public study asking how well do operators actually adhere to those rules that they agreed to um, in the consensus-based format as, as we come to know at the United Nations. And there's an understanding actually in the operator community that those rules are being followed because for good reason, there, there's never been a collision in GEO, which would be devastating from a physical perspective because of the physical nature of that particular domain. And the, th the reports of harmful interference are rarely made public. So we don't really know how many issues of harmful interference there's been. There's an understanding that those rules are being followed at a rate of maybe 90 or 95 percent. But this tool I developed, the ITU Compliance Assessment Monitor, proves that that's not the case. In fact, the rate of violation is closer to 20 percent or 25 percent. And we need these clues about this history, this heritage of spaceflight and high altitude spaceflight. To, to inform the discussion that's happening right now in multinational fora to coordinate behaviors at, at low altitudes. So I'd say my audience is really decision makers in the international community at low altitude, um, but I'm speaking to experts who've been governing in this space domain and other por portions uh, for a long time. And it's it's I find myself sort of shaking people by the shoulders and saying like the time is now to make new decisions and our assumptions are wrong and we have to we have to reevaluate them and I'm so happy to be able to contribute evidence based data driven solutions as part of this discussion really leaning on my background in computational astrodynamics and and sort of you know butting my head into international relations in a way that's not terribly common for the traditional engineering community. And, and is, is an innovative approach that I'm so happy is, is, is being honored by, by your organization and, and by today's discussion. Well, thanks, Thomas. Um, uh, well, of course, you know, uh, you're, you're a doctoral candidate at, at MIT, but as you mentioned, of course, you've also got a foot in Switzerland since you came over to EPFL. Uh, and of course, uh, your, your tool is also uh, uh, designed uh, to uh, work uh, in relation to the ITU, which is Geneva-based. And um, uh, so, of course, I was wondering, uh, what do, what does it mean for uh, you to have uh, earned uh, this first place in the GCSP prize uh, this year? And, and, and what will that mean for the development of uh, the ITU CAM? I think it, it, this, this moment really means a lot. It means that this, this approach has legs. And when I say this approach, I really mean that when we're in conversations in multinational fora about what these new rules should look like, th those conversations are really driven by values. What do we want the space domain to look like? How should we share that space? And those are important agenda items. But in my work, I'm adding a new agenda item. How do us operators actually behave in the absence of rules? Or, or in the few cases where we do have some, are they, are they really following them? And that is a new paradigm in space governance that I am very proud to be introducing into this conversation. And so it means a lot to have this sort of support. Uh, Switzerland is, a, is the center of this conversation. Um, I'm in residence at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, but to sort of answer some of these questions, and it, this project relied on understanding the international coordination process administered by the ITU, which there is publicly available data online describing the filings submitted by um, ITU member states to the ITU Radio Communications Bureau and vice versa. It's a long multi-year process to secure these protections from harmful interference in space. I wanted to understand that process at the level of an expert. And to do that, I needed to go to the ITU's headquarters in Geneva. I understand not far from 
from where most of you, some of you are sitting right now to go knock on doors of radio frequency engineers and career professionals to understand this complicated process, an admittedly complicated process uh, described in the 2,500 page ITU radio regulations to be able to understand how I can relate astrodynamic data of which I've earned expertise as during my doctoral work at MIT and translate it to the regulatory environment that really feels like another language, but one where there are fluent speakers running the halls in Geneva. And so it was such a pleasure to be able to go and meet them person to person and understand their approach to their work. Uh, to do that, I, I earned a visiting researcher appointment at nearby EPFL with support from the Swiss National Science Foundation. Very grateful to the Think Swiss Research Scholarship and support from MIT's Switzerland program. Uh, and, and to me, in the future, I intend to go back to Switzerland to share some of these results. Uh, I'll be speaking with the Secretary General of the ITU to share the results from this work, but also the Director of the Radio Communications Bureau, the Chief of the Space System, the Space Services Department, um, but also other stakeholders in the community who've been uh, paramount to this project's success. Great. Well, uh, you've, uh, of course, uh, given us a little bit of an insight, but uh, my, my final question to you was going to be uh, exactly, you know, uh, uh, what sort of the next steps that you're envisioning for the uh, the pursuit of the uh, the project and 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 also perhaps, uh, you know, what, what are some of the other institutions and stakeholders? Uh, well, you mentioned some of the Swiss ones you're in contact with, but perhaps are the other uh, ones that you'd like to develop a relations with? Sure. Uh, so you caught me right in the middle of a developing project. I have plenty of products to show, and I'd like to share my screen and show one now, but it's on its way to bigger and better things, to have a comprehensive understanding of the space environment and do translational work between the astrodynamics community and the regulatory community, both of which have serious troubles in communicating their work to a broader audience. So I'm trying to solve two communities worth of problems at the same time. And so I partnered with uh, a fantastic space data aggregator company called Privateer Space, uh, co-founded by Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, but its chief scientist is a member of my doctoral committee, Professor Mora Baja from the University of Texas. And if I may share my screen, um, I can give you a, a little peek of what this content will look like on uh, on the, the, the Wayfinder platform, a tool on Privateer Space. So if anyone goes to privateer.com, they'll see a visualization of all satellites around the Earth. And this is a, a, an important tool to help people understand that the kinematics of the outer space environment are really just different than terrestrial mechanics on Earth, where objects move in ways that are not exactly, um, there's not necessarily what you would predict having lived your entire life on the Earth's surface. Uh, but there's a, a catalog here where you can learn more about individual objects. So I've pre-searched for a particular satellite called NIMIC-2, a Canadian telecommunications satellite. And uh, I'm partnering with Privateer to add my ITU compliance assessment monitor, monitor into Wayfinder. So, so users can, can click to learn more about NIMIC-2, see its trajectory within the geostationary belt over time, and understand the history of its compliance with the ITU rules, with an opportunity to click and dive deeper and deeper into the history of behavior for this particular object, but also aggregated across all satellite operators. What country is doing the best at following the rules? Or are there any patterns that emerge about rule breaking? One that I've, I've noticed is that satellites in GEO stay there for a long time. Our keynote speaker made a mention of this, how some satellites have been in, in orbit, especially this high altitude geostationary orbit for many years. They have operational lifetimes over 30 years where technologies really change on the ground during that time. A pattern that emerges in ITU compliance assessment work is that those older satellites, which are still contributing to missions happening around the world, are, are, are more likely than newer satellites to no longer be following the rules. As a satellite operator gets in the game for maybe more than a few decades, they start to realize that there's no, there's, there's no one checking if you're following the rules prior to my work. And you might actually not have harmful interference by operating where someone isn't. Or if you notice a satellite isn't using all of the frequencies allocated to them as part of the international coordination process. Um, and, and you see newer satellites doing a lot better at following the rules, which is actually a promising narrative as more and more satellites enter the environment and they enter a denser and denser environment. You see higher rates of 
of following these rules. So I'm so proud to be able to partner with Privateer. Their platforms are already doing great work in the astrodynamics community to share um, with those outside of our area of expertise how satellites work and, and what the environment looks like. And I'm looking forward to injecting my results um, as part of my ITU compliance assessment monitor into their tool to sort of do that same work for the regulatory community. Yes, thank you. Well, thank you, Thomas. Uh, you know, this is all fascinating, and uh, we're certainly uh, looking forward to meeting you on your, your next visit to uh, to uh, Geneva. So again, congratulations, and, and, and thanks for enlightening us uh, on this, uh, this matter. Uh, so we're now going to jump over to a different technology and a different uh, uh, part of the universe, and, uh, especially H2O, uh, and we'll go over to uh, Matteo Cese, uh, who's representing uh, Chexa Limited, uh, so our second place uh, winners. Congratulations to you and to uh, all your colleagues uh, uh, for winning this, this uh, second place. Um, my first question to you would be, uh, of course, uh, uh, how did you set up uh, the company and, 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 and develop this uh, innovative technology? So first of all, I would like to and my appreciation and my congratulations to Thomas because it is he's addressing a very complex issue and he's trying to make very elegant tools out of it. So um, congrats, Thomas. So I'm Matteo. I founded a Chexel LTD to make rapid test kits to identify pathogens in water. So we are trying to get something that over here, I put it over here, that looks and feels like a, like a flow test cartridge because people are really after the pandemic, they are really comfortable, they really have a good understanding what a diagnostic can do to actually try and find this pathogen in water. It's a really strong problem, strong issue. But uh, before, before that, before getting into the problem and proposed solution, uh, we felt, my team and I, we felt compelled, uh, since most of us, uh, we have a science background, uh, to bring science to people. So what happened was that while I was doing my master's, I encountered different uh, scientific advancements, and I thought they were quite significant. But how academia works, it takes a lot of time to bring innovation out to the public, making products out of uh, uh, advancements. So I thought I was really compelled to make this product, make this company, because the thought was, if I'm not making this uh, diagnostic, this technology now, I don't think other people will take on it. Or at least it will take five, six, seven years for people to realize the potential and actually move that to, uh, to the public. So there's a huge divide between what academia does. Uh, the scientists are, are great on doing their own job. But there's this, this, still this huge divide in bringing science to people. So we already saw in biotech when it comes to uh, different issues like GMO, vaccines. It takes a lot of time. And scientists are not necessarily the best people to actually bridge that gap. So with this idea in mind, I said to myself, you know, I can look for a job in academia. I can still like work on this or I can just jump ahead. Really like a stressful decision but worth it to make a startup. So why a startup instead of an NGO? Why not academia? We thought uh, a startup, a private company, was the best way to bring this technology to the market. Uh, we could have chose to be a social enterprise or a B Corp that are like mixed um, forms, uh, legal entities where you can actually develop something good for society, but still that component of investment, product investment, and trying to find a business model that can make your product, your company financially sustainable was key. So in our case, um, the problem is that currently in order to detect pathogens in water, the only reliable way to do so is through laboratory testing. So over here in uh, Western society, there's plenty of laboratories. But even then, uh, laboratories need uh, trained personnel, equipment, infrastructure, and the methods are not being updated 
and we still rely on methods that take between 24 to, 80, uh, 24 to 48 hours to actually detect the pathogen that we are looking for. So the idea was, why don't we try to make something that is quick, easy to use, and on site? And by doing that, our mission is to bring these tasks to low income countries. And you can imagine uh, people using communities. Um, we can use that for disaster relief, military organizations, peacekeeping missions. They have huge issues when it comes to water safety, water quality. But at the same time, uh, our business model is to sell these tests to Westerners. So you can see people in uh, Western societies using these uh, before traveling. So by baker, travelers, households, or people that have a swimming pool, a spa. So the idea is that people are still willing to get hands-on results about the quality of the drinking water or recreational water. We can make a financially sustainable model out of it. And by having that financially sustainable model, we can subsidize, we can have tiered pricing and sell a subsidized version when it comes to low-income countries. So as for now, the problem with low-income countries is accessibility. So there are not many laboratories, there are few and scarce. So samples, it could be a blood sample, saliva, or water sample, needs to travel hundreds of kilometers, reach the right facility, uh, hoping that it's the right personnel, equipment, there's no power outbreaks, and also for the ability. The issue is still these tests are quite affordable, they say. So to quite affordable, relatively speaking, over here in uh, Western society. But when it comes to uh, places like India, Bangladesh, uh, South Africa, where there's still like cholera, uh, cholera is still present, and a lot of nasty pathogens are still present that kills uh, so many infants and adults, it is a tough choice. It's a tough choice on, do I want to prioritize the health of my family members, or do I want to put food on the table? So it was quite a, a journey, but as for now, from our secret source, uh, this by we have the secret source, our biologics, our science, we are making now cartridges. Uh, we're still like, um, let's say, validating our cartridges, but soon enough, we'll get this product to field test. So that is going to be uh, the next step. So. Well, that's great. Well, on 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 this odyssey of uh, you're bringing uh, science to the people, which is you know I think uh, a really great concept. Uh, I was going to ask you uh, uh, how does the second place uh, is going to help you uh, on on that journey and 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 how to promote the uh, technology that you're developing. So, this is brings a lot of awareness to the problem. When I'm speaking to to people. They know the problem when it comes to infants, infants that, that's about pneumonia or diarrheal diseases. So people are aware of the problem. Uh, they are aware that water safety is really important to them, but they do not necessarily know that there could be a better solution. So when I speak to people, the people are still stuck with the status quo uh, because there was Innovation in this field was quite stagnant. People do not know that it could be a better solution. So even though the problem is there, everybody knows there's a problem. People do not necessarily know about a solution, at least a piece of the solution. Uh, we need to be very humble in uh, knowing that we point to the problem, but education, infrastructure, sanitation, that needs to uh, filtration systems that actually needs to be implemented to actually solve the problem. So we have one, one piece of the puzzle, but people didn't realize that you can do uh, the same test in 30 minutes rather than 40 hours, or even like you shouldn't wait days to get your results. And when it comes to these decisions, that are like some of, some of the time, especially low-income countries, life or death decisions. So Having this recognition not only like proves that we are on the right trajectory in solving like a, a problem, but also it's going to be a great opportunity platform for us to reach out to more people, uh, organizations, and policymakers, stakeholders. They are not aware that we can 
manage outbreaks in water quality, water surveillance way better than we currently doing. So uh, exposure, uh, most likely, but um, exposure and also the pleasure of my team members and my pleasure knowing that, yes, we are on the right trajectory and um, our voices are heard. People are listening to us. People are valuing our, our own idea. We should continue uh, doing that. Well, uh, certainly good work there. And, and that allows me to uh, pass on to, to my uh, last question to you, which would be uh, uh, on, 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 of course, you've said a few things about your, your next steps uh, as, uh, as well. And, and, and probably, of course, uh, you've perhaps uh, uh, envisioned uh, what are going to be the, uh, the areas uh, in which this technology is going to be uh, uh, put to uh, put to use, uh, and uh, sort of the what, what sort of the results that you're you're expecting out of that. So, when it comes to the next step, we got um, minor setback. Uh, we were expecting in 2024 to do <clears throat> uh, field testing in uh, Wadi Rum, so between Jordan and Israel, uh, but current uh, due to the current geopolitical situation. Situation, we had to reschedule these field trials. So, but apart from this setback, our priority is to get this test kit as robust as possible. We envision this not only be used for tap water in um, Western society, but also being used in extreme climate, in arid regions, low income countries where uh, the water sample is not necessarily the best. So, the water sample could contain solvents, chemicals, and different components. And we would like to try to nail it down to have a test kit that can have a long shelf life, that can be used remotely, be very easy to use by the end users. And in that sense, we've done some work trying to make it more uh, accessible in terms of illiterates, impair, uh, people with impair, impaired vision, people with having problems with mobility. So it is not just making the test kit, but we need to get that really robust and get really good feedback, especially from the people that um, we should say. The people that most need them, uh, and these are, let's say, um, not, uh, my English, not fragile, they are like, um, what's the word? Vulnerable? <laughs> no, the, the, exactly. So the, the people that uh, are most fragile in society, because, it, yes, we can provide this test kit, but even a illiterate, somebody with some impaired vision, people with mobility, infants, women should be able to use it. So 2024 will be mostly dedicated on doing field trials. We found some partners apart from uh, Jordan and Israel to get these uh, test kits on the hands of people. But that process and also the accreditation that is quite important. So the accreditation is also a key component because when it comes to actually pursue uh, and trying to find liability or bring these tests, these results to a court or to get these results valid in terms of a st a studies, these tests should be accredited. And that takes a lot of time, especially when it comes to ISO accreditation. So the test itself needs to be effective, but there's all other features that are needed to enable the people to make the best use of it. So not only needs to be work, it needs to be work for the most fragile people in uh, communities, low income, low income countries, low resource settings, but also we would like to pursue an accreditation so they can actually enable and challenge uh, their own government, the local authorities, and drive change. So that's, that's it. it. <laughs> okay, well, listen, thank you uh, so much, Matteo, and uh, congratulations to you and to your colleagues at uh, Chexa. We'll wish you the, the best on these, uh, these next steps. Um, and now we're going to go to our third place uh, winners uh, this evening. Uh, so to uh, the CPRI team uh, represented uh, by Claire McAllister uh, to talk about uh, the uh, Environment of Peace uh, initiative.
Um, and uh, so to you, Claire, of course, my, my first uh, question would be uh, if you can tell us about how uh, was this uh, initiative conceived, how the team was put together, uh, and, and the needs that inspired that. Yeah, thank you so much for the question, Paul, and, and huge congratulations to the other winners. I'm just kind of sitting back thinking about the huge diversity of the three projects that we represent and and but also weirdly some similarities as well as differences between us um so the environment of peace um initiative was very much i think the brainchild of the director of uh, stockholm international peace research institute and it was really uh wanting to do two things it was recognizing that when we had the idea in the end of 2019, early 2020, that it was in 2022, it was going to be 50 years since the first UN conference on the human environment. And really to try and think about what do we know in this space now about these growing and emerging uh, risks that we see from environmental crisis. In the words, I guess, of uh, the chair of our international panel, kind of we're seeing the world that we attempted to avoid back 50 years ago at that conference. Um, and it was also about, at that point, about five years since the, the last really big uh, overarching sort of global study on the linkages between climate change and insecurity. And in that time, our understanding of the interactions between these and the interconnections, the research world's understanding had grown enormously. And we really wanted to try and capture that. But we also wanted to do two or three new things in that space. One was to expand the framing, because a lot of research has really focused in on more what, what's the what's the relationship between climate change and insecurity? And we all wanted to expand that horizon and say, actually, we're looking at, you know, the, we talk about the triple planetary crisis, um, we talk about multiple environmental crises, but loss of biodiversity, desertification, ocean, ocean acidification, like all of these environmental uh, crises are creating new risks to peace and security. So we wanted to capture that much broader understanding of climate and environment. And we wanted to not only look at some of the risks that the crisis themselves are bringing, um, uh, but we also wanted to look at the process thus far in terms of a green transition and to say, what could be some of the risks of action to address these environmental crises if not done well? And that was really building on emerging work, um, which is often seen as kind of backdraft or, backdraft or boomerang effect, whereby well-intentioned policies are actually resulting in kind of negative unintended consequences on peace and security because their full consequences are not being understood or thought through. And finally, I guess we wanted to bring in this, this point about hope um, because this is a really, you know, we know that climate change is aggravating um, existing conflicts, existing tensions and grievances and creating, you know, contributing to new ones. But we also wanted, and this was a real push from our international panel to say, where are there stories of this being dealt with well? Where are there places where we are doing things about these environmental risks, which are actually having positive consequences? And they really set as a challenge to go about and find those positive seeds of hope, seeds of peace, which we could point to so that people could be convinced that there was, there is space to work here. We just need to do it and we need to ramp it up quite quickly. Well, thank you, Claire. I mean, for uh, leading us uh, uh, to this as uh, as well, because of course you have a a, a quite uh, large uh, team uh, at work. So uh, I was wondering whether you could tell us about uh, what was the the challenge of uh, <laughs> developing the research and the reports, um, and uh, what did you find that was anything uh, particularly uh, novel or or, or different uh, about proceeding this way. Yeah, I mean, we, we, um, it was quite an organic process. I guess I can say that as, is that we envisaged this quite neat small team that go, would go out and do lots of field research and then suddenly a global pandemic hit. But also the more we looked at what we had 
to cover, the more we realize, well, we need to bring in these people and these people, and we need to commission some new research. And suddenly from a team of five or six on Organogram, we became this huge team of kind of 30 researchers. And I mean, challenging absolutely just to keep kind of everybody knowing what everybody else is doing and everybody making sure that they're kind of all fitting into this very tight time scale to produce a report. But what I what also the pandemic forced us to do was say we can't do field research, but that means we need to go out and do a lot more stake like consultations with different stakeholders, practitioners on the ground, kind of people who are seeing this kind of uh, day to day. What? How do they understand these questions? Um, we brought in a, a kind of um, a youth panel, and that for me was one of the best things that we did because actually not only did the consultations with them shape what we did research on, but then the consultations with them about the uh, the kind of first drafts of the report really changed some of the framing and how we were understanding these questions, particularly around climate justice um, and sort of some of these growing tensions that we can see between global north and global south in terms of climate action. Um, and so in the end, it was a we built these huge networks and the product of that is that the report was so much more rich because of it. But to navigate time zones and Zoom calls and doing long meetings on Zoom is exhausting, as you all know. Uh, so it was uh, it was all worth it. But yes, there was some logistical challenge, uh, to say the least, in kind of keeping all of our threads tied together. So of course now we're in in in, in post pandemic times. So uh, uh, I guess the the field research is going to kick back in uh, with a, a greater intensity. And uh, I was wondering, uh, of course, you know, when you're when you're considering your your next your next steps, uh, whether that involves uh, experimenting more in a specific pilot area or several. Um, and and of course, you know, uh, what does the uh, uh, this recognition in, as a third place uh, winner uh, in uh, this year's prize, uh, how can that help you do that? Yeah, I mean, thanks for the question. I mean, I think in terms of what you were saying about how does the prize help us, one of the things that we've really tried to do is reach a much wider set of policymakers and stakeholders and practitioners than are typically kind of targeted with this kind of research. It's trying to say to whether you're a development actor, a peace builder, a humanitarian actor, whether you kind of making environmental policy or whether you're in diplomacy or defense, like all this cuts across all of these sectors and to try and make that case that you should be interested in these questions because what you do affects their out outcome. So this helps us, I think, just broaden that even further. And one of the things we've also tried to do through the report, through some of the stakeholder engagement afterwards, through some of the dialogues, is to try and break some of the silos in sometimes very close communities that sit next to each other don't often talk kind of whether you frame yourself in terms of climate security or environmental peace building whether you kind of work more on the policy side or the research or the practitioner side to build some of these networks because one of the things to go back to like what next is very few people have challenged the recommendations we've put forward. They they completely see the need to have much more holistic programming, to understand these kind of interconnected challenges much more sort of together and to find some much more joined up solutions to them and to sort of integrate environment and security questions. But the question is always then how? How do we operationalize this? How do we make it happen? How do we in terms of our kind of day-to-day -day programming actually changed the way we work. And so a huge amount of what we're trying to do going forward in terms of research here at CIPRI is actually talking about what does effective implementation of this look like? What is good practice on the ground? How do we know? So some of what we're doing is also accompanying specific organizations as they're trying to build their programming to address these interlinked problems and almost kind of accompanying the whole re the whole cycle of that project in order to, to both advise and give support to the project as it is undertaken, but then also ensure that those learnings are passed on. Because 
One thing that we do need to do as more pilot projects, as more action is undertaken by different organizations and institutions in this space is to learn from each other pretty quickly what works and what doesn't. Um, and so creating platforms for those conversations is really important. Well, thank you uh, very much, Claire, for uh, elaborating on that. Um, I think well, we'll, we're almost, of course, drawing to a close uh, to the, the ceremony. Uh, of course, now we've heard from uh, uh, the representatives of the, the three winning teams. Um, and uh, uh, I think I understand we may have uh, uh, one question uh, that's uh, addressed to Thomas. Uh, I don't know if I can uh, find it here or they're going to forward it to me but of course uh of course this this uh um event is of course the the opportunity for everyone of you who've been uh, uh participating to of course uh get over your contact details and certainly if if you don't have time to have all of your questions asked uh certainly they'll be forwarded to uh, you uh, as well so oops uh, excuse me i'm just uh opening up uh, to read the question for Thomas, if I can see it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, oops, right. Um, uh, okay, I have to use my uh, allies here. Uh, question to Thomas, how do you utilize high dimensional space object data collected from ground and space-based telescopes and radar systems to advise international space decision makers? And what challenges do you encounter deciphering this complex data? Uh, sure. So for those who- <laughs> I don't know if you, you can answer that in a few minutes or so, but- <laughs> I, can, I can do my best. For, for those who, who don't know, it, it's, it's challenging to track space objects. The, the delightful part about observing the space environment is that you can't hide Satellites reflect the light of the sun. No matter how much money you put into this system, you can't be secret about where it is. But when we take photos of the sky, which is optical astronomy for satellite tracking, it's, it matters where the object is, but it's six dimensional because you need three dimensions to describe where it is, but also three more to describe where it's going. So this is a high dimensional, high volume data problem to be tracking where a satellite is, where it's going. And if you have the luxury of having done this for a long time, that rich history of where it's been. So, you know, the community of astrodynamics develops algorithms to understand that data. I'm part of that community and I, I employ traditional methods that have been around since the first satellite was launched in 19, the, the end of the 1950s. And What's changing now is the, the vast qual quantity of and quality of that data is skyrocketing. And we can you we're kind of being overwhelmed in our traditional methodologies, but we also have new ones at our disposal that weren't here even five or 10 years ago, which are artificial intelligence informed techniques to comb through that mountain of data and maybe even see patterns that we don't see or, or we are biased as analysts by our own understanding of satellite operations. My understanding of satellite operations is biased by the satellite operator that once employed me or my colleagues and friends who have told me about their operations, which are mostly from the US and Western European countries. That does not represent the entire world's view on satellite operations. What does an algorithm see that doesn't know about those biases or likely has very different ones of its own? And if we can understand what those are, can we use that to better understand where satellites are going? I hope that's a good short way of describing that. Great, thank you, Thomas. Um, well, uh, as I said, you know, any further questions uh, for you, for the other uh, place winners uh, will be forwarded to you. I'm sure we're all gonna stay in touch and uh, uh, see you uh, going on to uh, all of these great things that you have uh, uh, been putting together and, and, and allowed you to be recognized uh, in this year's prize. So uh, we're reaching the, the conclusion of our uh, event. So of course, I uh, want to thank uh, all of you who've uh, joined us to, to view uh, this and participate in the uh, discussion, uh, contribute to, to the webinar and to the discussion with our uh, place winners uh, as, uh, as well. Uh, of course, congratulations uh, to uh, the jury members on uh, having uh, solved a difficult issue of uh, 
uh, attributing these, these places as well. Uh, and also, of course, a, a big thank you to uh, those teams around the world who submitted uh, all of uh, these uh, fascinating projects uh, to uh, this year's edition. I'm sure we're going to hear from you again, as, as, as Lauren said, you know, the, the story does not uh, end here, uh, of course. Um, so for us, of course, uh, we're going to uh, um, bring this to a closing uh, at the GCSP. Of course, thank you for those who've been participating, uh, especially Ambassador Thomas Greminger, uh, Professor Nayef al Rodan, uh, to Gasmend uh, in the uh, webinar uh, as well. Uh, I of course, I want to thank those who've been working behind the scenes, uh, colleagues at the GCSP, uh, Christine, Lisa, Ines, Federico, who've uh, made this uh, event uh, uh, possible uh, and, and manageable. <laughs> so uh, that's it from us. We're going to look forward to see you all again uh, soon, uh, according to which time of the day it is for you, a bit longer for you, Thomas, than uh, uh, for us. A uh, nice rest of the uh, uh, day. Um, uh, we'll hear from you soon. And uh, uh, from us now uh, at the GCSP in Geneva, uh, goodbye and keep well. Thank you.